welcome everybody to our um, Bible study on Colossians chapter 4. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you that we are accepted in your beloved Son and that we can come before you in his name, um, the name that is above all names, the, your preeminent Son, the heir of all creation. We thank you for your precious word to us in the King James Bible and for helping us to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we pray that this little Bible study today will be a great blessing to everyone who hears it and that you would be glorified, Lord, that it will um, be accurate to your word and um, help people to know the truth. Yeah, thank you that we are already complete in Christ and that we don't need to do anything but just to enjoy serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, everybody. We are um, in Colossians chapter 4. Um, duty, Christ's preeminence displayed in our walk. Verse 1, a continuation of Christ's preeminence in our workplace. We actually covered that verse um, last week, but we're going to add a little more to it this week. And um, well, I'm kind of waiting for my, for my machine to finish. Okay, there we go. Verses 2 through 6, Christ's preeminence in our witness to those who are without Christ. And then verses 2 through 18, Christ's preeminence in our service to others who are in Christ. Uh, we're going to review a little bit of what it means when God says, ye are dead. Mm -hmm. To clarify exactly what that means. And we're going to, um, so, you know, basically what that means is that we are dead to um, the uh, body of the sin of the flesh. We are dead to sin, as it says in Romans 6, verse 2. And we are dead to the law, as it says in Romans 7, 4. And we are dead to the world, as Paul tells us, that he's crucified to the world and the world is crucified to him in uh, Galatians 6, 14. So when we're dead, the, the power or influence of the world has no more influence on us. It can't influence a dead person. So that's why we're dead to sin. And we're dead to the law. And we're dead to the world. So uh, that is a really important to understand. So what does the rudiments of this world mean? It means the limited, elementary, pathetic understanding of man of what is going on in creation. Mm -hmm. And also Paul tells us that we are not spiritual Israel. That, you know, the things of, um, that pertain to the Israel are a shadow of things to come. Mm -hmm. But that's not what God is doing now. He's mm -hmm. working on the body of Christ. So in this lesson, we're going to go over the four main judgments of Jesus that have been given to Jesus Christ. And we will also talk about free will that he has given to his creatures. Uh, what does it mean watching in prayer in verse 2? And what does it mean to walk in wisdom in ver verse 5? And what does seasoned with salt mean in verse 6? And what does it mean to be a faithful minister in verse 7? Justice was of the circumcision, so what is he doing working with Paul? We're going to go over that. And what about Dr. Luke? Was he a Jew or a Gentile? Was he a member of the body of Christ? Or was he a member of the circumcision since he wrote the Gospel of Luke? And I'm going to tell you what I believe as we get to that verse. Um, we will also go over God's five courses of punishment to Israel 
because of their unfaithfulness because it's so key to understand the five courses of punishment um, that God tells us about in Leviticus chapter 26. Now, if you miss that part as I teach it today, it is not in God's secret, although God's secret is how to, you know, have an understanding of the mystery and the, the Bible, um, but it's in Romans chapter 14. I go over the uh, five courses of punishment in chapter 14 of Romans, a concise commentary. So if you have that, you can refer to that. I have also written, along with Patty, who's here, and we're hoping that Maureen will come soon. We've been praying for her. Um, also, 1 Corinthians, a commentary. 2 Corinthians, a commentary. Galatians, a commentary. And Ephesians, a commentary. We also have Treasure Hunt, Volume 1, which is um, commentary only, no introductory uh, information of um, Romans to Galatians. So um, let's start. Oh, let me just show you this tiny little picture right here. Um, the kingdom of God is made up of two realms, heaven and earth. And that will be important to keep in our minds as we go over this chapter. Okay, so let's do a little bit of ch uh, chart work. Um, first of all, I want to show everyone um, that on my arm I have no nail print. Okay, and I use myself a lot as a typical, ordinary uh, Body of Christ member as an example of a, what a Body of Christ member. So, I don't have a nail print, but my Savior does. And so, I can never really understand when, it's said, when people say that Christ's sacrifice was vicarious. Because I know he did it on for our us and our um, our part, but um, you know he did the, he suffered the real pain and shame and punishment that I deserved. So um, I deserve to um, if you can I deserve to burn in the lake of fire for all eternity. Oh, good, Maureen made it. I have your coffee there ready for you. And, and to, you know, like de de degenerate into a worm. That's what I deserve. But God didn't give me what I deserved. He died on the cross for my sins. And we're going to talk about the effectiveness of his blood today as we go over this lesson. Because not only did he um, die for the sins of everyone in prophecy, which is the white part, Mm -hmm. He died for the sins of everyone in mystery, which is the yellow part, mm -hmm. because the people in mystery, they will live in the heavenly places, mm -hmm. and the pl people in prophecy, they will live in the kingdom on earth. Mm -hmm. So after um, our, uh, the mystery began with Paul's salvation on the road to Damascus, mm -hmm. and will end with Christ, when Christ appeared to him, mm -hmm. and it will end with another appearing of Jesus Christ, in heaven to, you know, catch us up um, at the rapture, and then we'll go to the judgment seat of Christ. So after God is finished with our dispensation of grace, see, um, informing the body of Christ in the mystery, mm -hmm. which is the mystery, then he will resume his dealings with Israel, and there will be the seven years of tribulation, and then he will come at the end of that, at his second coming, set up his 1,000 year reign, and after that, um, there'll be a final um, part to the judgment of the Gentiles, and we'll go over that today, and then um, the great white throne judgment of the lost. So the great white um, judgment of the lost is the last part. 
So let's begin our study. Is everyone mm -hmm. um, ready to turn to um, Colossians chapter 4? Follow me with the camera there. Okay. Just uh, okay, all right. <laughs> okay. All right, good, Patty. Good. Okay. So, um, uh-oh. I don't have my glasses. Patty, um, I think I left them in the kitchen. Did you want to go over a bit of the stack of books there? Oh, I did. Okay. I did, yeah. Um, I just washed my glasses, too, so I can see clearly. Do you need your glasses to find your glasses? I almost do. Did you find them, Patty? No. Look in the bathroom. Okay, so... Um, Let's everyone turn to Colossians chapter 1. And I hope I don't have to go looking for him. Is it 104? Can is you it, find him, Patty? No. Is it chapter 4? 4. four. Ch okay. Chapter 4, verse 1. Okay. Okay. Patty, 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 just come here. I'll look for him. Uh oh. Okay. Now you have to do that music. Dun, 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 dun. Should we sing a song? All right. What's it? Oh. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation is that Christ liveth in me. Oh, I found them. Me. You know what? They're right here. Oh, oh. dear. Okay. okay, we're good. Okay. Um, verse 1. Uh, Maureen? Four one. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. This verse really belongs with the preceding information because the new paragraph doesn't begin until verse 2. Paul has just told us that we can serve the Lord by doing our duty in our homes and workplaces. We are to serve the Lord as we take care of our daily domestic responsibilities. Masters, employers should give their employees a fair wage on time. The master's employer's real master is God in heaven. Uh, masters and, sl and, and slave, master and slave are now brothers in Christ. Um, the understanding of Paul's doctrine the equality among the body of Christ has helped to destroy slavery in many parts of the world. Patty, can you close that yeah. window, please? The master will give an account for service done for God while he lived as a member of the body of Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore, judge nothing before the time. I think that one's okay, Patty. Um, whatever you want. Yeah, Until it, the Lord good. come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man be praised of God. So, nothing is going to escape at the judgment seat of Christ. Where was that verse? That was in 1 Corinthians 4, 5. We will not give an account for our sins, because they were judged on the cross. Our sins have been dealt with, and we'll we will never be judged for them again. His blood was sufficient. And what do we say? Amen. 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 And thank you, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, the Lord Jesus Christ will evaluate each believer's quality of service. One, whether what we did was in according to his word. Two, with his spirit working in and through us. And three, if it was done for the glory of God. So now we're going to go over the four major judgments in the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ will judge in every case. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment to, unto the Son. John 5.22 The first uh, judgment is where we went over already. The judgment seat of Christ um, for service, not sins. And it is exclusively found in Paul's epistles because it is exclusively for the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Everyone at the judgment seat of Christ will be a body of Christ member. 
just like everyone at the rapture will be a Body of Christ member. And it's, the rapture is only and exclusively found in Paul's epistles. God's five um, courses of, of punishment upon his people, Israel, is the second judgment. That judgment began... Uh, so the last installation of that fifth part of, of punishment, Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, has been postponed. So um, this, this, um, the fifth course began, we're going to talk about that, at um, the Babylonian captivity. So um, the purpose of Jacob's trouble is to purify his people, to purge out the rebel. I will purge out from among you the rebels, Ezekiel 20, 38. So that's among you, the Israel, okay? Those who will not trust God will not enter the kingdom on earth, okay? Those who will not trust God in that last seven years or has not trusted God uh, before in prophecy will not enter the kingdom. The third judgment is the judgment of the nations to determine which Gentiles in prophecy will enter into the kingdom on earth. Christ will separate those Gentiles who have become sheep like Israel because by faith they bless the true Israelites, embrace their doctrine, and believe Jesus of Nazareth to be the Messiah from the goats. And so that judgment will be at Christ's second coming of the nations. Um, and, and he will determine which Gentiles in prophecy go into the kingdom. So notice that the kingdom was prepared. So uh, and he, he says these words about this judgment in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Notice that the kingdom was prepared from the foundation of the world and therefore includes all believers since Adam. Notice that the lake of fire is everlasting punishment, not annihilation. The final Gentile judgment will be at the end of Christ's millennial reign here. Um, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Okay, so um, shall we read some of these verses? Or um, shall we just call it? Okay, so let me just say before, yeah. And then we'll go to the last judgment after that. Let's go ahead. Let's turn to Matthew 25, 31 through 36. And I'll summarize these real quick. Because we have a lot to cover today. Because we're going to look at those five courses of punishment at the end of our study in much more detail. But still in a simplified way. So in um, Matthew 25, 31, it says, And he shall send his... Oh, okay, actually, let's make it 32. Um, now, learn a parable... No, no, no. Where am I? I'm in 24. That's where it is. Okay, 31 is right. Okay. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So... Wait, wait. Are you in Matthew 25? Matthew 25, 31. 31. Okay? I just read oh, that. Oh, okay. Okay? And so, angel, um, Jesus Christ comes back with his angels. Okay? When he comes back at his second coming right here. And before him shall be gathered all nations. Those are the Gentiles. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. See, from the foundation of the world, that kingdom was. So that includes Adam. Um, for I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink I was a stranger and ye took me in naked and ye clothed me I was sick and ye visited me I was in prison and ye came unto me then shall the righteous answer him saying Lord 
Okay, these are the self-righteous. Uh, no, no, these are the righteous. These are the right. Okay. When saw we the ones that were going to the kingdom, the sheep? When saw we thee and hungered and fed thee and or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick and in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So when they were caring for his believers, believing remnant, they were caring for Christ. Then shall ye say also unto them on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So the everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in, naked, and you clothed me not, sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, When saw we thee, and hungered, and the thirst, and a stranger, and naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then he shall say, answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into it life eternal. So, um, there we have it, the judging of the nations. Okay? So, Let's um, uh, turn to the very last part of the judging of the nations, which will be at the end of the millennial reign. Um, turn to Revelation 20, verse 7 through 9. So, um, people will show their faith by blessing Israel uh, during the tribulation. So, in 27, it says... Um, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, and the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. So they circle around Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So that's the final judgment. Because <laughs> he doesn't need to, you know, doubt. He knows that everyone who's around the city is an unbeliever. So he's going to just poof, snuff them all out at once. Okay, the fourth uh, judgment of Christ is the great white throne judgment of the lost unbelievers. That's mentioned in... Um, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Let's go through that. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell uh, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Notice it's not according to Christ's work. Mm -hmm. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, Patty, verse 2. Colossians 4, 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Okay. Paul, oh, so we're going to answer the question, what does watching um, mean in this verse? Mm -hmm. Paul has been telling believers how to walk, live, worthy, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That was in 110. 
Christ's glorious power, long-suffering with patience and joyfulness works in us, verse 111. So that was 110 and now 111. We are continually thankful to God for our eternal life in heaven. That's verse 112. Because of our faith in Christ's finished blood sacrifice proved by his resurrection, we have forgiveness of sins. 114. Verse 114. Okay, let me just mention real briefly that Colossians 1.14 um, is changed in almost all modern uh, Bibles. The uh, blood, uh, through his blood is removed. And in the New King James Bible, it has the, the, the blood, but the, it has a footnote which casts doubt on um, the accuracy of that verse in the New King James Bible. God gave his creatures, men, cherubim, angels, etc., free will. He did not make them robots. God wants both men and angels to willingly serve him as responsible sons in heaven and on earth. There was always a risk that his creatures would make the wrong decision, so the Godhead had a safety plan ready from the before creation. God had a plan, but Satan had a plot. Satan was the first to make the wrong choice. God found iniquity, which is wickedness, in him, Ezekiel 28, 15. Satan was the anointed cherub that covereth, um, Ezekiel 28, 14. He wanted um, to be worshiped and be like the most high, as it says in Isaiah 14, 14. He wanted to be the foremost ruler of heaven and earth. Satan persuaded one-third of the angels to follow him in his plot, as it says in Ezekiel 28, 5 and 18. Satan promised the angels positions of power in his kingdom if they followed him. God said, by the multitude of thy merchants, dice, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. That's Ezekiel 28:16. God, knowing that his creatures may not make the right choice and trust what he said, had a safety plan. By predetermined <coughs> counsel of the Godhead, the Son of God volunteered to shed his blood and die to pay for his creatures' sins if necessary. God was, he was God's secret weapon. God could trust himself to redeem his creatures and creation. He knew that the Father would raise him up if he executed his plan perfectly. Therefore, before God created anything, it was decided by determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God, Acts 2.23, that the second person of the Godhead would be the Redeemer. The scarlet thread of redeeming blood is a continual theme throughout the Bible, culminating in the perfectly satisfying sacrifice of God the Son upon the cross, Romans 3.24-26 and 1 Peter 1.18-19. The Lord God offered up the first blood sacrifice of innocent animals to clothe Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Unto Adam and also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and skins and clothed them. Genesis 3:21. The innocent animals died for their sins, not Adam and Eve. A Adam, yeah, it was Adam and Eve's sins. But Adam and Eve didn't die. Mm -hmm. God made it known that the shedding of blood is necessary for forgiveness of sins. This is why it is wrong for the new translation to leave out through his blood in Colossians 1.14. Mm -hmm. And without the shedding of blood is no remission or forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22 Abraham said that said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Genesis 22, 8. Paul said, 
speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all. 1 Timothy 2.6 Paul said, The innocent, sinless Christ not only took our place, but gave us his righteousness. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. See, he knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him sin for us because he was without sin. Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13.8 It was a bitter, painful cup of wrath a uh, cup of the wrath of God to drink. But um, the Son of God obediently and courageously triumphed in the plan of the cross. This plan was not only to redeem mankind, but all creation. Ultimately, this plan of redemption will com culminate in the Father's plan to glorify His Son over all heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is the heir who will rule over all things in heaven and earth. He will be with we will be with him in heaven, glorifying and serving him there. We love Christ and want to serve him out of gratitude for his loving sacrifice for us. For the love of Christ constrained us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And um, we, we talked about ye are dead at the beginning of this um, message. Mm -hmm. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. Our eternal life began at salvation, and we don't have to wait to serve him in heaven. We can start serving him now. We are in the process of determining what our reward, job position, will be at the judgment seat of Christ for service. Our focus should be on letting his word dwell in us richly in all wisdom. Um, Colossians 3.16 Wisdom is believing what God says. God says he is currently dispensing grace in the mystery of Christ. We are to approach his word rightly Dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, where God divides it. We divide mystery from prophecy, the white part from the yellow part. We are to continue in prayer, constant communication with God. We watch prayerfully for an opportunity to serve our Lord, while giving thanks to Him for our salvation, eternal life, and the spiritual understanding He continues to give us of his word rightly divided. Next, Paul will tell us how to serve, how he serves God, so we can do the same. Um, Maureen, can you do uh, verse three and four? With all praying, also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Paul has shown them how to pray in, in chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And now he gives them a specific prayer request. He asks them to pray for him and his fellow servants that God will give them an opportunity to share the mystery of Christ. Our Apostle Paul is in bonds because he tried to share the mystery in Jerusalem four years earlier in Acts 22, 17 through 24. God made Paul his minister to reveal or manifest the mystery that was hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to the saints. Verse 126. He is the one apostle of the Gentiles, the master builder of the body of Christ, and the steward of the mysteries. Romans 11, 13, 1 Corinthians 3, 10, and 4, 10. Paul wants to be able to reveal the truth that Christ has revealed to him, as he mentioned in Galatians 1, 1, 11, and 12. The dispensation of grace, of the grace of God, was given to us, to him for us, to him for us, as it says in Ephesians 3, 1 through 12. 
We should take every opportunity to save souls out of the present evil world. Galatians 1 4. 4. Galatians 1 4 talks about the present evil world. We are not told to convert or fix the world, but to reconcile or convert souls one at a time to God by what Christ has done. Jesus is God. He told us through Paul that in the last days of the dispensation of grace, which we are in now, we're over here in the end part of the yellow, um, perilous times shall come, 2 Timothy 3.1. So we should not be surprised if we suffer persecution and the world becomes worse and worse instead of better and better, as it says in 1 Timothy 3.12-14. We are to continue in the truth of God's word, rightly divided, as lights in the dark, evil world doing God's will, as it says in Ephesians 5 8. Our goal should be the same as Paul, our pattern. Um, one, uh, 1 Timothy 1 16, it says that Paul is our pattern. We should pray for an open door to speak the mystery of Christ. Patty, verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Walk in wisdom. Live your life in full assurance of the mystery. Verses two, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. We are to use our time on earth to make as great an impact for Christ as we can. We are to conduct ourselves wisely toward those without Christ. See how it says in that? Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Mm -hmm. Without what? Without Christ. Without Christ. Without Christ. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. all, you know, it could be extrapolated also without understanding of the Bible, rightly divided. But um, that kind of comes later. Okay. Um, so, um, to walk wisely, though. See, see, to walk in wisdom is to understand the divisions that God makes in his word. That if you don't understand that, you're not being wise. Okay? So wisdom here has to do with understanding the mystery. So, um, we are to conduct ourselves wisely toward them, uh, toward those without Christ, the unsaved who are not in the body of Christ. Use your time wisely to do God's will whenever the opportunity arises. God's will is that we save souls, by sharing the pure gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Uh, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And to help other believers by communicating the mystery to them at every opportunity, as it says in 1 Timothy 2, 4. So we're going to be looking, we're watching for an opportunity to do what Paul wants to do. Uh, verse 6, Maureen. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. We should always say things in a gracious way as servants of Christ. 317. Uh, where it says that we're servant, servants of Christ. Um, I believe seasoned with salt See how it says, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, mm -hmm. is the word of truth rightly divided. Mm. Paul's sound doctrine. We quote the swift, powerful, living word of God, especially Christ's um, words from heaven um, through Paul in Romans to Philemon. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 We share the word either uh, from memory or from the Bible. God is dispensing grace today. Okay, so let me just say that it's the power is in Christ's word. It, it, that's what's so sharp and two-edged. So um, that's 
Whenever we have an opportunity, we want to quote scripture accurately. So God is dispensing grace today. The riches of his grace is that because of the Lord Jesus Christ's performance, we have the have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, as it says both in Ephesians 1 7 and in Colossians 1 14. We are to be so saturated in our understanding and so certain of the mystery and the rest of God's word that we may know how he ought to answer every man. Okay? This is why we're doing these lessons, so that we will know how to answer every man. Uh, verse 7, Patty. All my state shall teach us, declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Okay. So we're going to look at what, what it means to be a faithful minister. Paul confirmed that Epaphras was a faithful minister of Christ in 1.7. Because he preached Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16, 25. Paul can count on Tychicus to also share Christ's ministry from heaven through him, just like Epaphras. Paul says that Tychicus is a beloved brother and a faithful minister of Pauline dispensational truth. And a fellow servant in the Lord. He will tell them all about Paul's situation in Rome how and what he is doing. Believers are fellow servants in the Lord when we share the word of God rightly divided to other. Um, verse 8, um, Maureen. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, <clears throat> that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. So he wants him to comfort their hearts. He wants them to tell the Colossians that Paul is doing well and he may be set free from his bondage soon. And also find out how the Colossians are doing so Tychicus can report back to Paul in Rome. Verse 9, Patty. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Onesimus or Onesimus, I think it's interesting that his name has one in it, hmm. since we are one body of Christ, hmm. has also come to faith in Christ and, the underst and understands the mystery. He, along with Tychicus, will make known all things concerning Paul and his ministry in Rome. Verse 10, Maureen. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. Okay. Paul's fellow prisoners, Aristarchus, a Thessalonian from Macedonia, was Paul's travel partner who was present at the uproar in Ephesus. Luke and him accompanied Paul on the ship to Rome that was wrecked at Melita. That's all in Acts 19, 29, 40, 20, verse 4, 27, verse 2, 3, and 28, 1. He sent his greeting. Marcus is John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, the nephew of Barnabas, the son of his sister. Mar he's called Marcus in his Greek name, okay? Marcus had traveled all the way to Rome to be with Paul. John Mark had left Paul and Barnabas on their first apostolic journey, and because of this, Paul didn't want him to come along on his second apostolic journey. Paul later told Timothy that Mark is profitable to me for the ministry, 2 Timothy 4.11. Some at Colossae may have heard of Paul's previous disappointment with Mark. So Paul instructs them to receive him and take care of him if he comes to them, meaning show him kind and generous hospitality. Verse 11, Patty. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. 
So Aristarchus, Marcus, and Justus are of the circumcision, and they are a comfort to Paul. Okay, so um, in other words, they belong to Peter's group of kingdoms on earth saints who will yet yeah, live in the earthly kingdom with Jesus their king. There was other kingdom on earth saints who worked with Paul to share the gospel of the grace of God, not the gospel of the kingdom. These saints, such as Barnabas, Silas, Andronicus, and Junia, which are mentioned in Acts 4.36, 15.22, and Romans 16.7, wanted to take part in what God was presently doing through Paul. The apostle in Jerusalem, the apostles in Jerusalem had agreed not to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the unsaved. In Acts 15, 14 through 16, 19, 24, and Galatians 2, 9. The circumcision believers realized that God was currently working through Paul to form the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace to live in the heavenly places and that God's dealing with Israel was on hold. So they were serving the Lord by helping Paul's ministry. As we know, God's kingdom is made up of two realms, heaven and earth. Um, 12, Marie? Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Okay. Perhaps Epaphras of, of Colossae stayed with Paul in Rome to find out how the hearing before Nero would go, and also to learn more sound doctrine and practice to take home and share. Epaphras, a true servant of Christ, in his ministry from heaven, sent greetings to those at home. So he stayed with Paul. He didn't go to, to Colossae at this time. Um, Who was the one that so, went to uh, Colossae? Was it was Tychicus and Onesimus. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So he was always laboring fervently for them in prayer that they would stand perfect and complete and not be moved away from the mystery as it said in 123 they are already complete in Christ as far as their justification and lack nothing perfect is the in the Bible is um, spiritual maturity not sinless perfection perfection is a result of of sanctification growing in spiritual understanding of God's word rightly divided he prayed that they may grow more and more in their understanding of the mystery when believers understand the word of God rightly divided uh, that they might stand um, they can st they should stand fast in the will of God when we understand that what God is doing now through Paul, then we can be effective sons and daughters to the Father, perfecting holiness. 1 Corinthians 7.1 Paul said he had not attained ultimate perfection of spirit, soul, and body in Philippians 3.12. Paul's goal is to gain the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, his, he constantly endeavored to press toward the mark that he may win Christ, Philippians 3, 8 through 14. We do not achieve sinless perfection in this life because we still have the dead sinful flesh resident in our mortal bodies and DNA. But we pursue Christ, his word rightly divided, working in us, desiring his life to be formed and manifested in us 100% of the time. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Galatians 2.20 and 4.19, and Romans 8.29 and 12.1 and 2, we find this truth. Um, let's turn to Galatians 4.19. Uh, it says, 
My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So, um, you know, basically he's saying that uh, Christ is not working in them if they're putting themselves under the law. So, uh, that's another reason to want to rightly divide. Okay, Patty, verse 13. Um, uh, 4, 13. Uh, for I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. So Paul can attest or verify that Epaphras labored fervently in prayer for the believers in these three cities. Epaphras may have been the one to evangelize and plant the grace churches in this cluster of sister cities, which explains his zeal that they would thrive and grow. Uh, verse 14, Maureen. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Paul did not include the beloved Dr. Luke in his list of the circumcision believers. So he must have been a Jew who was a Body of Christ member. The reason I believe he was a Jew is because all the oracles, the words of God, were committed to the Jews. Paul said in Romans 3, 1 and 2, What advantage then hath the Jew? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Every writer in the Bible is a Jew. But isn't it? Okay, so it's, it is amazing that God used <laughs> a body of Christ member to write one of the four gospel of Christ's ministry to Israel. <laughs> Luke had learned so much from the many he met, including Marcus, who was now visiting in Rome. Remember Mark, John Mark? Mm -hmm. And Philip the Evangelist in Acts 21, verse 8. Let's go there. Um, Patty, you want to go with that one? Oh, Acts oh. Uh, 21, 8. Okay. Demas was still working with Paul, but would eventually forsake Paul's ministry. As it said, says in 2 Timothy 2, 4. Maureen, you want to go there? 2 Timothy 2, 4. It is so sad when saints fall from grace. Um, go ahead, Patty. Okay. Acts 21, 8. And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Okay, so I'm sure Dr. Luke also learned a lot from Philip, okay, as well as John Mark. Go ahead, Maureen, um, uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 4. No man that warreth entangled himself, oh, 2 Timothy 2, 2 4? Timothy 2, 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Oh. Okay. I don't think that. that wasn't it. Okay. Oh, well, all have forsaken me. All have forsaken me, yeah. It's no, not, 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 Demas not has forsaken me. Yeah. It, I, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, Second Timothy 4.10 is what it was. Oh, okay. Okay. I can read that. All right. 4.10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Christians to Galatians. Okay, that, that's good. Yeah, so he he didn't forsake uh, Paul uh, personally. He forsook Paul's ministry. Okay? He, he, did, he stopped believing the grace message. He, he stopped believing that God had two realms. Okay? The, and so he fell from grace. Um, verse 15, Patty. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos, and the church which is in his house. So Paul sends greeting to Laodicea. Nymphos was most likely the pastor there and had a church in his home. Um, go ahead, Maureen. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans 
and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Okay, Paul's letters letter will be read aloud among the Colossians. How are the Colossians to cause that the letter will be read in Laodicean church also? Will they give them the original precious letter from Christ through Paul to them or make a copy? Marie? Make a copy. Make a copy. That's a no-brainer. <laughs> They're not going to send the original. <laughs> they will make several cult. copies. <laughs> copies of Paul's letters were circulating everywhere among the brethren. Notice that Paul doesn't say he wrote the letter to the Laodiceans. Look at that again. Cause that it be... Re uh, no, no. Likewise, read the epistle from the Laodiceans. Okay, see? but that they are to read the epistle from them. It may be that Paul sent them a copy of the letter to that, that he wrote to the Ephesians or the Philippians. Mm. See? Uh, verse 17, Maureen. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Archippus, the son of Philemon, was... Um, the pastor of the church in his parents' home, as it says in Philemon 1-2. Let's go over there. So Philemon is just before uh, Revelation. So it says, um, And our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in thy house. Okay, so he had greeted Philemon and his wife and their son. Okay, and we're going to get into that much more next uh, lesson that we will have in two weeks from today. We will cover all of Philemon in two weeks, uh, Lord willing. So Paul wants him to take heed to his ministry from the Lord that no false doctrine slips in among the believers. He can strengthen his local church members like Paul had has done in this letter so that they will hold to the head in uh, verse 2-9. If they understand the preeminence of the head, the Lord Jesus Christ, in all things, then no man can beguile them with enticing words. Okay. Um, so... He's, he wants uh, Archippus to fulfill his ministry, which is, you know, carry it through to the end. And uh, verse 18, Patty. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Paul ends the letter simply with his own farewell greeting and signature of authenticity as it says in 2 Thessalonians 2.17, that he would. In the last sentence, he adds a reminder for them to pray for his release from bonds. He wants God's grace to be with them. So um, let's just look at 2 Thessalonians 2.17 real quick. Maureen, you want to read that? And then we're going to go on uh, to God's five courses of chastisement to Israel. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and, I mean, every good word and work. No, 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 it was two, uh, Second Thessalonians oh. 17. Sorry. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is a token in every epistle, so I write. So, um, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So, Paul signed all of his epistles. So, now we're going to go into God's five courses of chastisement upon his people Israel. The dispensation of grace is holding back God's wrath, Jacob's trouble, as it's called in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Sometimes taking a look at Israel's program from the vantage point of Paul's doctrine gives us more clarity about our own program. Jacob's trouble 
is the seven years of tribulation, which is the last part is installment of Israel's five courses of punishment, which are mentioned in Leviticus 26. In Leviticus 26, 1 through 13, God promised Israel blessings if they worship and obeyed him. But in Le Leviticus 26, 14 through 39, God warns Israel that he will punish them if they make idols, mm -hmm. spiritual adul adultery, and do not obey his commands. Then in Leviticus 26, 40 through 46, God comforts them saying that he will keep his covenant with them. So the first course of punishment is Leviticus 26, 16 and 17. Their enemies will eat their harvest. That's, uh, that happened when Gideon in Judges 2.13. Uh, remember he was, um, th you know, threshing in secret um, some crops so the Midians <coughs> wouldn't get their food. So turn to Leviticus 26. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. <laughs> Okay, we're going to just go over these very uh, briefly. and um, these, So that was the first course of punishment. And it happened during the time of Gideon. Okay, and so we, we just finished 26, 16, and 17. So, um, the second course of punishment is mentioned in Leviticus 26, 18 through 20 is that the kingdom is divided because of Solomon's sins and God says he will punish them seven times more. God will not hear from heaven and famine is uh, what it says in 1 Kings 11, 12, 31, and 32. So these notes will be on God's Secret Facebook page and also um, along with this, uh, this uh, Facebook video. And um, there will also be a YouTube video, but not the notes. But there'll be a link to the notes that Aaron Grace always leaves. So all my messages pretty much uh, are on Aaron Grace, um, Aaron G. Aaron G. Yeah. Okay. So just put in, uh, go to YouTube and put in Marianne Manley, and you'll, you should find them. Okay. Marianne Manley Colossians. So the third course of punishment is in Leviticus 26. 21 and 22 is with wild beasts is that wild beasts will take their children destruction of livestock commerce productivity and will be left few in number that's in Elisha's time in 2nd Kings 2 24 again it will be seven times more uh, you know punishment then the fourth course of punishment, Leviticus 26, 23 through 26, is yet seven times more for your sins. And it is pestilence, which is disease, famine, and sword delivered into the hand of their enemies. The Assyrian captivity of the Northern Kingdom and the loss of their land. Uh, of and people in 2 Kings 17 verse 6. The fifth course of punishment is his fury. So, you know, they've been going through that, uh, but it was postponed in our dispensation. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Leviticus 26, 27 through 39. There will be severe famine and destruction of the cities and sanctuary. God will not accept their sacrifices. The times of the Gentiles begins with the Babylonian captivity of a southern kingdom and ending at the second coming of Christ. This is talked about in 2 Kings 25, 4, 10, 21 and 2 Chronicles 36, 17 through 21, Daniel 2, 44 and 45. Daniel 9, 24 and tw through 27, and Ezekiel 36, 17 through 18, 38, 17 through 38. Remember that 7 times 70 is 490, 
and that in the tribulation there will be seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials of wrath poured out. At this time, the Jews and those who bless them will use the King James Bible or equivalent to anticipate every event and Christ's return to the day. So they will know the exact day that Christ will be returning. Okay? So, um, however, God will still keep his Abrahamic covenant with his people, which he tells them in Leviticus 26, 40 through 46. God says that if they confess their sins and humble themselves, God will remember his covenant with Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. Notice it's the reverse order. <clears throat> and the land and not cast them away or destroy them utterly. God will remember why he brought his people out of Egypt and parted the Red Sea for them, that he might be Israel's God. The tribulation will complete the 70 weeks of Daniel's timeline and finish the transgression of Israel, as mentioned in Daniel 9.26. The purpose of Jacob's trouble is to purify his people, to purge out of them, out the rebels. Those who will not trust God will not enter his kingdom on earth. And I will purge out from among you the rebels, and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country, where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 20, verse 38. So that concludes um, our teaching on Colossians chapter 4. And um, we will see you in two weeks for um, our study in Philemon. And uh, so we're taking next week off. Let's end with a, a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father God, I pray, uh, praise you and thank you, Lord, that your blood was all sufficient, that you are all preeminent, that you are the head, that the Father, it pleased the Father that in you should all the fullness dwell, and that we will glorify you forever and ever for your great sacrifice for us. We thank you so much for your word and this study in Colossians. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, bye.